Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Robots Are Coming. And today I will be interviewing Professor Chow, uh, the Betty Hutton Williams Professor of International Economics Law at the Dale E. Fowler School of Law. Um, her primary expertise is in international business, international trade, corporate law, economic development, and the rule of law. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to say that we have a Patreon now where you can support the podcast and I can invest it um, um, to you all with better equipment, content, and to help in my passion for technology and public policy. My name is Kenyon. Let's get started. Um, so first off, can I uh, get to know a little bit about yourself, where, um, about your childhood, all the way until where you are now? Just a quick synopsis. Thank you so much, Ken, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, well, I was born in Vietnam and born right into the war, in the middle of the war. So issues of war, conflicts, uh, migration have always uh, resonated and uh, stayed with me. So uh, a lot of my writing has been an attempt to wrestle and understand that. So I was born in the war. Uh, my family mostly were fighting uh, on the side of the Republic of Vietnam, which is known as South Vietnam. I also have an uncle. Uh, he's dead now, so I should say had an uncle uh, who was uh, a Viet Cong. So uh, dualities and dichotomies and seeing opposing sides have sort of been in my soul, my DNA. Uh, his son, the son of the Viet Cong uncle was raised by my parents and he, the uncle would often come and uh, sort of subterraneanly visit the son. So there's the idea of, you know, very, um, uh, the, the conflict entered our house, in other words. So it was, right. it was impersonal. Um, in 75, uh, as we all know, South Vietnam lost the war and uh, many, many refugees left. So uh, in 68, I should say, I, our family became very good friends with an American uh, colonel. At the time, he was a colonel and he had been shot down during the Tet Offensive. And um, my mother took care of him at the hospital and brought me to the hospital as well. So I got to know him uh, in Vietnam, was introduced to American culture and sort of like American rock and roll music through yeah. him. Yeah. And in 75, he had left after 68 or 69, but he flew back in 75 and adopted me. My parent um, sent me out as his, uh, adopted daughter and uh, he took me to Connecticut a small town in Connecticut right outside of Hartford called Avon and I stayed with him uh, and his wife and um, they have three sons uh, in Avon until my parents came out a few months later wow. so, and you know I and then when they came I moved down to Virginia uh, which is the right outside Washington D.C. to be reunited with my family. Well, that, that's a, that's a beautiful story, and I, I find, you know, how you grew up in in, in South Vietnam. For example, my my father um, grew out grew up in, in South Vietnam, and as a result of the war, he you know ended up staying there. And uh, while my grandfather uh, was serving a, a decade in jail as uh, as a result of serving as a as a as an intelligence officer as a part of the Vietnam War. So I, I get that side of things. He's very, you know, anti-communist, um, very pro-republic of South Vietnam. And uh, I also attend UC Berkeley. Um, and as, as you can imagine, I, I have a professor, um, a very great professor, Professor Jay Raman. Um, she went to Yale Law School like yourself. Um, she uh, is more on the labor side of things, which could uh, be very close to the uh, um, uh, you can call it the the Viet Cong side of, of things, and and I've had both duality of perspectives as a as a student, like living in San Jose with my grandpa, hearing his stories, talking to Yale uh, law grad uh, professor Jay Raman. So I, I can relate to that aspect. 
Um, and you also mentioned that um, you lived in uh, Virginia for some time. I, I, I'm training for the Marine Corps right now because I want to become an officer someday. And uh, I'm a, I'm, I want to go. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, um, uh, it's in Quantico. And uh, I have a buddy of mine who's who went to VMI, Virginia Military Institute. So he talks a lot of, about great things about um, VMI out there. Um, so that's my little Virginia is taken. I, I mean, you uh, you went you got a BA in political science from um, Mount uh, Holyoke College. Sorry if I mispronounced that. And uh, you're JD from Yale Law School. And after law school, you worked as a as a litigation and corporate attorney at various New York City law firms. Um, and clerk for federal judge Constant Baker Motley. Um, and my relation to New York is, uh, you know, I, I campaign for a mayoral campaign out there. I love the city. Um, it, it might not be for me because I'm, I'm, I'm a native Californian, uh, but we'll have to see where I end up. Um, I, but you also wrote a very amazing book that I, I, I enjoyed um, reading, and I'm sure my audience will uh, enjoy listening to it as well. And you wrote a book called Monkey Bridge, which tells of a story of a mother and daughter um, who decided to leave Vietnam to come to the US. And it, it sounds very similar to what the story you just told me. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about where you got inspiration for uh, that, uh, that uh, novel and, and semi-autographical story of yours? So I was part of the first wave of Vietnamese refugees who fled uh, communism after the war. And you know, the first few years were very alienating and lonely and very depressing. And so I spent most of my time in the library, the, the Fairfax County Public Library. Yes. My parents would deposit me basically uh, Saturday, Sunday uh, in the library. And I, I, I just wandered the various uh, stacks of the library. And I was very drawn to two types of books. One were history books. And I was very curious about how Americans saw the war because it, it the war obviously had an imprint on me. And the other books were literature books um, and poetry books, right? So all four years of high school, I uh, read every book about Vietnam that I could find written uh, in English. And I saw that there was literally at the time I couldn't find any books that were written about the war that were written by a Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So every book was by, uh, the, uh, by an American author, whether it be mostly American vets mm -hmm. and some were by nurses who had served during the war. And I, I saw that it was uh, only one perspective, the American perspective. I saw a lot of books also written by, um, like uh, groups like SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, um, which were anti-war, the, the spin-off group was the Weather Underground, uh, which was more radical than the SDS. And I was also very fascinated to read about that. But regardless of which iteration of American authorship had existed about Vietnam and about the war, it was very clear that everything about the war was an American property and an American domain and an American jurisdiction. And all right, cut and cut. all right, action. Yep. Go for it. Continue? Yeah, continue. Yep. And so it made me very upset because I saw that we were totally ignored and worse, that the omission was not even noticeable. You know, when when something was is the norm which is that Vietnam is an American experience and nothing more. Mm -hmm. If it's portrayed like that, you don't even notice it, right? Because it's so normalized. Because nobody even said, oh, how come this is only an American um, story? Right. So I thought I, I need to write something, you know? But at the time, um, I didn't feel that my English language was good enough and I had never taken a writing course. Then. You know, so it was just something that was building up over time. Yeah. Uh, by the time I got to uh, college, of course, you know, I was very um, stressed out. And <laughs> when I was law school, I was also <laughs> stressed out. So 
Right. And then actually I was in uh, at Paul Weiss, the law firm. Hmm. We, and it was, uh, again, a very high stress environment because sure. it's Wall Street litigation. But I, I was on the subway a lot of times. And, you know, the subways in New York yeah. often delayed and you'd be stuck between <laughs> tunnels and between terminals. So I had a um, notepad. So I just decided to write. There were so many minutes and half hours of just sitting on the subway that I thought I, I can do something while I'm sitting here. So I started my novel uh, on the subway, just kind of like cobbling together uh, little quilts of time. So I, you know, I thought to myself, if I write one page a day, after a year, I'll have 365 pages. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I wrote the book. And the first sure. version I thought was uh, felt too much like a brief, mm. you know, it was very, I have a point to make yeah. and it's really not how novels should be written because <laughs> a novel is much more about um, the human condition and it's not about an argument and there's mm. no, there should be no thesis. Mm. Um, you're not trying to convince the judge. You're not representing <laughs> a client. Right. So I rewrote it after I read it and uh, that's how Monkey Birch came about. It was, it, it came out of many, many years of noticing the omission, being very upset and depressed about it. And finally writing sort of out of the blue, it was just a spark that came without any plan, without any kind of thinking ahead. Um, and we're really without any understanding of whether it would be published or not. Um, I, I just wrote it. Well, that, that sounds really inspiring, you know, from, from someone who was learning English in, in the libraries of, 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 of you know, and, and, and all the way to writing a whole novel in, in a subway. That is inspiring to hear. And that's, that inspires me to, you know, start, you know, continuing to write my book because I, I need to get on that. Um, I, I do want to delve into um, your book, which which tells about a dual narrative told from two perspectives, uh, Mai and her mother, Pen. Uh, 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 can you tell us a little bit more about those two different perspectives and, and, and how you came up with that and what was your inspiration for that? The, the, the perspective of the child, the daughter, basically... Uh, encapsulates the perspective, I think, of many children of refugees, uh, whether they're, they, they could be born in this country, like maybe you are, right? Yeah. yeah. Or uh, the 1.5 generation, like myself, who was born in Vietnam, but basically uh, grew up and, and, and assembled in the U.S. Yeah. So the, that person is very cobbled, is very fragmented because it, the person is made up of East and West, um, parent generation, Confucius ideals, juxtaposed against a more, uh, I have rights, I have freedom, I am an individual ideal that is much more of a, an American perspective. So um, there's a tug of war inside that child, which is the child perspective. And how does the child navigate uh, between war and peace? You know, the, the parents continuing obsession and trauma of the war and the child's desire and, and necessity to forge a new life in America, right? It, it's a more future oriented life than the past oriented life of the parent. And it can create a very dis, a, a deep dissonance in the psyche of the child who's trying to figure all of this out. And um, kind of in the midst of a very traumatic background, which is that we've just fled Vietnam and fled the war. And you come into a country that really doesn't want to be reminded of the refugees who represent an American loss, right? So that's what I, I was trying to deal with that myself. So all of that is deposited in um, 
the character of Mai. And, and the character of Mai also deals with the public private space, you know, which is a lot of immigrant parent, uh, immigrant children finding themselves um, still indebted to their parents, which is mm -hmm. a very Vietnamese way. Yeah. And seeing that in public, their parents do not have the same stature because they cannot speak English very well and they, they have accents and things like that. Yeah. And uh, the public treating the parents as a foreigner. So uh, having to see that the parents have lost status, but still having to respect them, you know, inside the house, right? So outside the house, the child is is sort of the boss because the child yeah. speaks English much better right. than the parent. Right. Inside the house, in the private space, the parent has to reassert their authority. So I think there are just a lot of um, juxtapositions of opposing polar opposites inside the the character of Mai. So that's the perspective that I want to show, which I think is a very universal uh, struggle that children of immigrants and refugees have. The mother perspective is one of the parent who is uh, still carries the war inside of that parent. It reminds me a lot of what um, Faulkner said about the past, right? That the past, um, uh, the, the, I, I can't remember the exact quote now. The past is not past. It's not, the past is not gone. It's not even past, something like that. And I remember reading that book. It's not a very well-known book of Faulkner, but it resonated with me. Um, and I think the first generation is still very, embedded in that past and in the war. And because of my family background, being having an uncle who's a Viet Cong, you know, oh, yeah. uh, that is very much something that I, I'm still, uh, I, I was trying to figure out. And so one of the characters in the novel is of course, is, is a Viet Cong character um, mm. in, in um, Monkey Bridge. And I thought a lot of my uncle uh, during that time. In the end, you know, I, I don't want the novel or any novel to be ideological. It's, it's mm -hmm. not an ideologue uh, perspective. It's really, uh, I, I like fiction because of its ability to explore um, the gray spaces between right. life. And that's what I hope to um, project in a novel like Monkey Bridge, which is, um, a journey and each person has a very different journey and journey between war, uh, peace, east, mm -hmm. west, the world of duties versus the world of rights, which is what American law is about. You know, I have mm -hmm. rights. Right. Um, and of uh, refugee versus American. That's what the novel is about. That, that was certainly a beautiful and, and inspiring way to, to frame your novel and, and, and thank you for that. Uh, I, I I do want to say I I I do face some of the same struggles uh, through the character Mai, you know, not knowing whether I should stand with my family in terms of their ideology because my entire family is let's say uh, very anti-communist and 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 very Republican. Whereas I go to school at UC Berkeley, where a lot of my friends, peers, professors are, or uh, uh, on the liberal side, I've had professors like Robert Reich, Saru J. Raman. I'll come from from Yale Law School, really great professors. And also my grandpa, you know, even though he doesn't have a teaching degree, he, he was served in the military. Um, my father, like they all, uh, you know, they've taught me their values. And also the teachers at my, my, my undergrad taught me their values too. So I'm facing like the same struggles as, you know, I proceed in my career, whether it's as a judge or as a, a public official, like how do how did my you know choose to uh, uh for her certain convictions how did she choose her values if, if there's a tug of war between two values and how do i you know that that's a that's a very relevant question how do i start to think about where i stand at certain things like 
Should I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't think, Ken, that you, you yeah. need to have like the arc yeah. of the human spirit mm -hmm. is very complex and it does not have to be all the way one philosophy mm -hmm. for every part of your life, right? So for example, when it comes to the war in Vietnam, Right. You can you you can look at it yourself. This is how I have looked at it because I I have I was faced with the same situation. Right, sure. You were um, because I'm a very socially liberal, and mm -hmm. I believe you know in um, the rainbow coalition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. I, mm -hmm. I I am a, I I I believe in um, connections and alliances with. Um, Others who have been marginalized in this country, my, my clerkship with Judge Motley taught me an enormous amount about, and not just in a cerebral way, but in an emotional way, about how African Americans are in this country. She is the first African American female judge uh, who was appointed to the federal clerkship by President Johnson. She uh, was the architect of desegregation in the South, argued nine cases, 10 right. cases in the Supreme Court, and one nine. Um, and, I, and I would like Vietnamese refugees to know more about African American history and sure. how the paths forged by Black Americans have helped Vietnamese refugees in this country as well, right? I mean, there's a debt to be paid for that um, because a lot of the social improvements uh, that have been made in this country, political, social, were uh, trailblazers, uh, the trailblazers were African Americans. Um, now, with respect to the Vietnam War, yeah. you can ask yourself, without ideology, because don't think about ideology, this is how I ask myself, people voted with their feet. I mean, if communism is so great, why did people not, why did so many people risk their lives and leave? That's all you have to ask. It's not about ideology. It's about the fact that when peace came, mm -hmm. have you thought of the fact that there are very few countries where after the end of a war and peace came, that people would flee? Hmm. Why didn't they flee during the war when supposedly, um, when there was so much um, death? And destruction and bombs. What, what if what if those who uh, fled were let's say poor to begin with, or were looking for more opportunities in another country, and that's they why they did. during the war. I mean, Vietnam was a very was is a was and is a third world country. So if you if you if you are describing the fleeing as an economic migration, sure. they could have done that in the sixties. 61, 65, 70, 74, they could have fled to Thailand. They could have fled to Singapore, uh, Hong Kong. They didn't do that. So they, they I, I don't know of anybody who fled towards communism in the history of the world. Hmm. It's a very interesting take. I, I mean, I, my grandpa was offered uh, a get out of jail card by the Americans, but he chose to stay in, in South Vietnam to continue uh, to uh, stay with his family, and uh, and he was jailed by the communists because of that. And he's told me a lot of stories about wanting to escape uh, the reins of communism, being jailed at, uh, from those uh, re-education camps. Um, and I I think that is a very great argument uh, uh, against um, um, possibilities of communism. I I do want to note, like in uh, I took a, an entrepreneurship class at, at Berkeley, and uh, some of my peers have come from. Uh, 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 like China, Shanghai, China, and they, you know, they tell me about, uh, uh, you know, how great China is, and 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 uh, 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 even though they are a communist country, and you know, I we we do have certain debates about how America is run or how you know uh, how uh, different China is, and and it's interesting to hear their perspectives, and and how would you respond to someone who you know, I, I'm going to school with them in Berkeley and they want to go back to China. Like that's, that's you know, communist China. Like, like how would you respond to that? Well, you know that Deng Xiaoping uh, yeah. opened China up 
and he basically took at great risk he had to work against the hardliners in the communist party i think this was in 1978 mm -hmm. and he said let's forget about ideology and mm -hmm. the, the the mantra he used was black cat or white cat it doesn't matter as long as it catches mice mm -hmm. because the hardliners were saying we cannot introduce the market into a communist country without the market there were a lot of economic um, lack of development mm -hmm. um, china exploded into a rich uh, a relatively rich country um, sec second largest economy in the world now not because of marx yeah. but because it introduced the market and it did so by creating a non-state sector that is parallel to the st state sector. So it still kept the state sector under the control of the Communist Party, but it opened up and unleashed the economic private energy of the Chinese people in the parallel. They don't even call it the private sector. They call it the non-state sector because the word private is apparently not a good word for the mm. party. So the wealth that is created in China is from the introduction of the market. And and it's not from the implementation of Marxism or Leninism. Uh, they have kept a very tight lid in terms of political development so that the party maintains strict control in politics, but allowed the entrepreneurial private energy of the people to create wealth. And then the Communist Party would use the wealth created in the non-state sector to prop up the almost bankrupt state economic enterprises in China. So I think it's great that they want to come back and contribute to China. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that because China actually um, has, you know, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, um, as long as you do not say anything that offends the party hmm. um, just like in vietnam i mean vietnam has model has modeled itself after the chinese past you know unlike um eastern europe right which when the berlin wall collapsed they yeah. actually privatized their state enterprises vietnam followed the chinese path which is mm -hmm. allow a non-state yeah. sector right yeah. allow private enterprises right. allow vq to come back and uh -huh. money, but kept a very tight lid on the state sector and, and the political sector. Whether or not you can do that forever and not allow the spirit of the economic sector to seep into the political sector, who knows? Right, and, 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 and these are, this is why I, I think economic development is extremely important and, and as professor of, of, of uh, a lot of economic classes at at the David uh, Dale Eve Fowler School of Law. You you do teach a lot of classes on 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 economics. Could you talk to me about some of the classes you've been teaching and and what you've been delving into? Well, I teach now a first year course, uh, two semesters contracts. Oh, okay, that's a very interesting course. Which is an amazing course. I mean, it's yeah. it's a very um, it has very deep. Uh, roots in moral philosophy mm. and it's very crucial for economic development you know because if you don't have contract law then the only people that you can do business with are people you trust because you don't know whether or not they're going to keep up their end of the bargain right sure. if you have contract law then you know that the state is going to enforce any contract any promise that you make so uh before the establishment of contract law um economic exchanges were very limited because you would only do business with with either people in your clan like from the same village from the same clan or from uh, from the same family so economic exchanges were very limited and uh, there's a german philosopher who talk about the transition from what he called gemeinschaft which is community mm -hmm. to gesellschaft which is society so if you, if you want to have economic growth, you have to facilitate exchanges that are not just limited to community, yeah. but to expand them into the wider society. So contract law is what makes that possible. Mm 
Um, and of course, you know, it also have a, so from an economic standpoint, contract is very important. Mm -hmm. From a morality standpoint, it's also very important because people who've not been allowed to participate in the marketplace and the marketplace need contract law to enforce it. Those are the people who were women who were not, who, who were kept dependent on men so that mm -hmm. they will always need a husband or some male protector to, to support them because they would not never be able to enter into contracts themselves to support themselves and their children. So it's a way to keep people down if you don't allow them to participate in the marketplace. And of course, slaves were not allowed to participate in the marketplace because they're owned by their, uh, by their owners. So contracts law is necessary both for economic development as well as has very deep, um, there's a morality to the marketplace. And those who, who have been excluded are those who have been historically oppressed. So, you know, contract law is very intricate and very technical, but it has a uh, extremely important trajectory where political philosophy and morality is concerned. So I'm, I love teaching contracts. Um, I also teach corporate law, yeah. um, which deals, of course, with... Uh, with uh, limited liability and uh, how you can encourage uh, passive investors to contribute their capital into mm -hmm. a company that's run by experts like the board. Um, and, you know, of course, Vietnam has a company law too. I've, I've got come back to Vietnam to teach both oh, wow. law, uh, contracts and um, international business transactions as well as international trade. So, so those are my areas of teaching. And then scholarship is, is the same, um, how to transition from plan to market economies. Well, that, that's amazing. And, and the role hear. of culture in all of this yeah. as well. Well, it's amazing to hear about, you know, the, how you've intertwined political philosophy to contracts and corporate law, and, and you've been able to teach it at not only the law school you're at, but also in Vietnam, which I've never been to yet. My grandpa told me not to go there, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but it, it sounds like you've had a great teaching career so far. Uh, I want to revert back to your novel in, in Monkey Bridge. Like, is there are there points where you can see contracts or uh, corporate law intertwined inside your novel? Is that intertwined in any way, or, or even like the backdrop of contracts and and, and uh, corporate law, which is political philosophy, out in in, in your novel? Um. In my second novel, uh, The Lotus in the Storm, I think mm -hmm. there's a little bit more of that uh, because the first novel is is very much about, um, you know, the trajectory going from refugee to Americanization mm -hmm. and then the other trajectory pulling back, which yeah. is, can you go forward when you still have the trauma of war pu pulling you back? Mm -hmm. Um, the second novel deals a little bit more with um, the war from the South Vietnamese perspective, um, because most Americans are only interested in the war from the American perspective. And it doesn't matter when I say American perspective, I mean both Democratic and Republican. They're both American perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the war from American perspective, and to the extent that they're interested in the war from a Vietnamese perspective, they're yeah. more interested in the Viet Cong perspective or oh. the North Vietnamese mm -hmm. perspective yeah. than the South Vietnamese perspective. Sure. Because Americans um, tend to be very disdainful of the South, mm -hmm. you know, um, not worthy for their consideration. Whereas the North is like, oh, they defeated us, so we, we, we better go and, and study them. So I was interested in writing the second novel from the perspective of a South Vietnamese. And in there, there are issues regarding um, the uh, sacredness of promises, right? Contract law is all about promise. Which promise can be enforced? And which cannot, which is not, uh, which the law does not enforce. Mm -hmm. And I have so one issue that 
the novel talks about is when is the promise going to be kept? You know, because <clears throat> the the peace accord, the Paris peace accord, which mm -hmm. uh, Secretary of State Kissinger uh, negotiated, was a negotiation between North Vietnam and the U.S. It relegated South Vietnam into oblivion, and <clears throat> The reason why South Vietnam did not want to engage with that peace accord was that it knew that it was the death knell, right? Because at the time, you understand that Nixon and Kissinger were interested in a rapprochement with China. And South Vietnam is a pawn in that mm -hmm. rapprochement. It was going to be the sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not my opinion. This is all hist uh, historical fact. Right. In the sense that in order to pursue a friendship with China, the U.S. dropped Taiwan, as we all know it did, and it also dropped South Vietnam. It wanted an end to the war at whatever cost hmm. it has to be ended. And that served American geopolitical position at the time. It did what it needed to do for the U.S., right? So the U.S. negotiated the peace accord with North Vietnam, and it didn't even care whether or not South Vietnam was going to be part of that peace accord. Hmm. It enticed South Vietnam to be part of the peace accord by saying that if you don't join, then we're not going to give you any more aid. And of course, that would end the life of South Vietnam because the Soviet Union and China were continuing to give North Vietnam and the Viet Cong political, economic, and military aid. To get South Vietnam to sign the peace accord, President Nixon wrote a letter which promised the U.S. would retaliate if North Vietnam breached the peace accord. Hmm. And the letter, of course, is a well-known historical fact, but I guess South Vietnam didn't realize that the U.S. Constitution is one of separation of powers, which meant that an executive branch promise by itself without congressional provision of aid would mean nothing. So yes, Nixon did make that promise. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the peace accord was very flawed because it allowed North Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong troops to remain in the South. So it's not a real peace accord because usually when you have a peace accord, both sides go back to their respective boundaries. But the North was allowed to remain with all of its sanctuaries in the South. And uh, uh, Nixon promised that the US would come to South Vietnamese aid if the North attacked the South. So I was very interested in the sanctity of promises right? Yeah. Contract law has promises as the basis of contract law. So I explored that issue of promises made and promises broken and what that meant. So to that extent, you know, the idea of promises is something that I've, I've looked at in the novel. And in, in fact, when I taught contract law in Vietnam, mm -hmm. this was early, early on, like in 96 or something, and I talked about American contract law and the enforcement of contract law and how important it is mm -hmm. for economic development. And one of the Vietnamese professors, I think he was in Hanoi, mm -hmm. he said, yeah, you know, it's good to have contracts law, but ultimately he himself would never enter into a contract with anybody unless, because he, wouldn't, he would not rely on contract law to make sure that the other person would obey, uh, would keep their promise. And he said, because that costs a lot of money to have to sue them, mm -hmm. right? So he would rather go and see how that person treat their parents. Are they supporting their parents in old age? Because mm -hmm. that is a promise that is very important in Vietnamese culture. So he said, if he goes to that person's house and sees that that person has abandoned their parent, he would not enter into a contract with them because clearly they don't keep promises. Hmm. 
So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, and and, and it's really different culture out here, and and for a lot of uh, 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 European uh, Americans out here, where you know the culture is a little bit different, where uh, you're not expected to you know pay back for your uh, uh, your parents, and or how does that affect American law, American contract law, and 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 now I'm thinking back to how that affects like Vietnamese contract law, and then Vietnamese American contract law. So that that's that's a lot of topics that, that 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 and a lot of things that that popped into my mind as you mentioned that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I I do want to uh, delve into something that's very useful for what I'm uh, writing about uh, is is about uh, the naval war in Vietnam and uh, a lot of it has to do with the you know uh, the South Vietnamese perspective right and. Uh, have you had your fair share of, of talking to to South Vietnam naval officers or even uh, military officers and stuff? You know, well, while while you were a youth or or, or you had you know exposures and interviews to them. Um, we have a family friend who was a um, I don't know commander of one yeah. of the Southeast Vietnamese ships. Yeah. I was I was very little, so and my interaction with him was was more like you know do chào and just <laughs> yeah. everyday stuff. But yeah. I do know that there is a uh, currently an American, a Vietnamese American who is a uh, who commanded a ship. Hmm. You must have heard of him because he got a lot of um, publicity. The ship docks in Vietnam now under hmm. his command. Um, yeah. Because you may know that Vietnam is very, uh, or at least one faction of the Vietnamese in the Communist Party is interested in having some rapprochement with the U.S. Hmm. as a counterpoint to China. And the U.S. is also interested in maybe returning to Cam Ranh Bay. Hmm. Uh, and you know that Pro Vice President Harris last year when she made her trip to Asia, Vietnam was on at in one of her stops. Hmm. Um, so given the rise in, of China, which ironically the US, you know, dropped South Vietnam for in order to be friend China, yeah. the, they've come full circle because now China is a serious competitor. And the US now is trying to return to Vietnam as a counter to China. Yeah. Um, so the Vietnamese American who I think commanded one of the ship is now commanding the ship that is in, that has docked in Vietnam. You may mm -hmm. want to look at that and, and maybe look him up. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely take a look and, and maybe try to contact him too. Um, I, yeah, I also, he, he, yeah. he fled Vietnam as a very young boy. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah. I, I met him at a... Uh, it's called the Museum of the Republic of Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, talking to them on, on Facebook, messaging them uh, there in uh, Westminster. Yeah. Yeah, right. He came to talk. He gave a lecture. Oh, at wow. That museum. So okay. I'm sure they can they can connect you with him. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to uh, reach out to them and, and and talk to them more about that. Uh, I I know you also mentioned you have an uncle in in, in the the Viet Cong or the the Yi uh, for that matter. Um, I, I'm curious to, you know, I, I haven't met maybe any public Viet Congs out in San Jose, and, you know, not that I, you know, I'm not, I'm not too aware. Um, I've only read a book on um, a North Vietnamese perspective on, 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 on how they won the war. And that was through, uh, according to one book, uh, through class conflict, through uh, making sure that the peasants and the workers would rise up. And that's how they were able to uh, fight against uh, the South. And from and, and I've also um, read uh, from South Vietnamese perspectives about how, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing my grandpa say like he, he was committed to the end, but from an American naval perspective, you know, they, they could be seen that the Vietnamese were, were seen as not uh, lacking initiative or, or not having enough aggression. So, so there's there's just a lot of interplay between South Vietnam, the American officers, and also the Viet Cong. And my question to you is, Professor, like, what what did you learn from your uncle? And what and what have you learned from all the Viet Congs you've interacted with over the years? Like um, that, you know, I wouldn't 
maybe find in the book that I read. Yeah. I only have one. I've only one. interacted with one Viet Cong. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's more than that's, enough. That's <laughs> my, and that's with my uncle. Yeah. Um, the, you know, I, I returned to Vietnam, but they're not Viet Congs. You know, the people I met mm -hmm. in Vietnam. I mean, they're we we did. You know, I I stay away from politics when I go to Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. you notice that I all the subjects that I teach are economic subjects, right? Like oh. I, I'm not teaching constitutional law in Vietnam. Not that I'm not that I would be qualified to teach sure. it because I'm not a constitutional law scholar by any means. Mm -hmm. um, I did not teach criminal law or mm -hmm. freedom of speech or the First Amendment or anything like that sure. in Vietnam because the, the, those are not my areas anyway. Yeah, my areas yeah. are international trade, mm -hmm. world trade organization, corporate law, contracts law, international business laws, international mm -hmm. trade. So those are areas that um, Vietnam is very interested yeah. in developing. So when I go to Vietnam, I'm only discussing those kinds of things with them. So I have no idea whether they are, what their political ideologies are. Yeah. Um, the only Viet Cong I know is my uncle. And mm. uh, I think he viewed himself as a nationalist, right? Like, mm. I, I, like, like, um, he, he wanted, he, he probably saw the U.S. as a continuation of the French. And oh. he mm -hmm. wanted to, just like the Vietnamese ended French colonialism by defeating the French, he mm -hmm. saw the Americans as um, another Western power that the South Vietnamese wrongly hitched themselves to and that he was the true nationalist and therefore he needed to kick them out. Um, I know that there are there were Vietnamese, uh, Viet Cong and maybe North Vietnamese who, when they went South, thought that South Vietnam was a extremely undeveloped and poor country that blood was flowing from the streets due to American domination. Mm -hmm. and that they were coming to liberate the South. And when they got to the South, they were shocked at how advanced and industrialized and modern the, the South was co and compared to the North. And I think many realized that the story they were told about how the South was a basket case needing salvation from the North was not true. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I think that my uncle saw that the whole family left, right? When the North came, of mm -hmm. one, in fact, uh, he even told me when I, I, the first time I went to Vietnam was in 91 and I, I went to visit him and he, he met me at Tung Sinh Yik airport and mm -hmm. he was wearing a cap that said, Pepsi welcomes you to America. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I well, don't know. It, it, yeah. He, he, and, and his son left Vietnam, yeah. left Vietnam as well. His son, whom my parents raised and the rest of my family raised became a uh, big Dom Kung which is a ranger fought, fighting against his father. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that is very comprehensive, but you've had this experience with, with your uncle, knowing him and his motivations and, and, and you know, maybe seeing him as this uncle figure. And, 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 and even, even though you escaped Vietnam, you, you had this diverse uh, perspectives and you cross ideological boundaries to create this wonderful book, Monkey Bridge. Um, and as we move forward in, in the future of, of international trade, economics, geopolitics, how do you think that the themes of your novel, Monkey Bridge, will serve to inform future leaders? Uh, uh, you know, as we as we move forward uh, uh, to different economic, corporate, international trade, as 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 time moves on, like like how do you think this novel should serve as as a as a message to future leaders? Um, 
I think that the people of Vietnam would like to see the country develop economically, right? So that um, the the country can rise and pull itself above poverty level mm -hmm. and join the ranks of country that are modern, progressive, and with political and economic um, development. So I've always seen uh, the power of economics. Um, I love the fact that, you know, you, if you look at Germany and France, they were two countries that were at war against one, one another in two war wars. And you have now the European Union, which started out as a coal and steel economic uh, 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 economic community linking the coal and the steel industry of two countries together. And that's designed to make those two industries which uh, are needed to create armaments and ammunition, that those two industries between two former enemies would be united in a way that would make future conflicts and future wars very difficult, right? So there, th those, those two countries sort of handcuffed themselves so that it would not be possible to fight wars against each other again. And it's through linkages of those two crucial industries and through trade, uh, which, you know, you see, the, the European economic community starting out with Germany and France and now becoming a European Union uh, and a European Union that won the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago. So through trade and economics, hopefully um, you will have a lesser chance of war erupting. And that's why I have always studied economic development being a child of war. Um, I, I I like the rule of law mm -hmm. as a way of solving conflicts rather than right. war and economic integration as creating incentives for people of different areas to cooperate economically. And from a literary standpoint, I like the idea of bridges, you know, and, and I would like to have a bridge between uh, the Vietnamese who have fled Vietnam and those who are the Vietnamese people in Vietnam mm. for whatever reason that they are still there, right? And they yeah. are young, yeah. they're youngsters. Most of the people in Vietnam yeah. were born after the war. Yeah. Regardless of what side we have been on, <laughs> you know, they, those, the, the war was from their parent and their grandparents' generation. And my view is that to the extent that I can contribute to create a uh, a possibility of harmonious openings where we can agree, all the better. Well, well thank you, Professor Cao, for that inspiring and, and, and harmonious message. And uh, to this end, I do have a bridge behind me rep representing- <laughs> The Golden Gate Bridge, right? The Golden Gate Bridge representing that uh, that, that hopeful bridge that we'll have in the future. and and. Hopefully, the economic policies and and international trade policies will bridge the link between, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, new Vietnamese folks and 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 the Vietnamese folks out out in Vietnam. So so that's that's something to bridge about as we look towards the future. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Cao, for having this wonderful conversation. It's a pleasure to have been with you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and and thank thank you everyone else to uh, for listening to this episode of the Robots Are Coming. Uh, next time, we'll have even more wonderful professors like Professor Cao here speaking on the topics of things like corporate law, entrepreneurship, technology, and public policy. So make sure you subscribe to The Robots Are Coming wherever you're listening to and uh, tell all of your friends to do that as well. Thank you so much.